Good morning, everybody. My name is Angela Bo. I'm the recruitment and training coordinator here at CGD. And hi, everyone. I'm Megan O'Donnell. I am assistant director for gender and a senior policy analyst here at CGD. First and foremost, I just want to welcome everybody. Um, this is a really big turnout. So like, um, we're excited to have you guys here um, to be part of this really critical conversation that we're going to be having. Um, we recognize that CGD um, operates within a sector and a space that has seen many challenges in terms of being inclusive and diverse and has historically kept out a lot of critical viewpoints and voices uh, out of a lot of conversations that they should be a part of. Um, so part of my role here uh, includes implementing diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts to ensure that CDD is attracting, um, bringing in, and retaining the talent that most accurately reflects uh, the global community that we're working so hard to serve. Um, some of the ways we're doing that is strategically positioning ourselves to expand our networks everywhere from our affiliated scholars to peer reviewers, audiences, panelists, um, and in recruiting as well. Um, so we've also brought in our student reach and our associate pipeline with our summer delegates program and internally we're providing um, staff training on critical DEI topics like implicit bias, um, intercultural communication, um, and much more. So CDD is taking active steps to challenge its own norms and we will certainly benefit from today's conversation. So again, I welcome you guys all here today. And I want to echo uh, Angela in welcoming you to this space for today's conversation, uh, which for those of you who have been to CGD before will know is not a traditional one for our organization. Um, I recently rejoined CGD after a couple of years out and I'm so grateful to Angela and human resources colleagues here for the efforts that she just walked you through for what we're doing from a human resources perspective to promote a diverse and inclusive workspace. Um, but I wanted to compliment, you know, the efforts that she just mentioned by saying that we, of course, recognize that challenging, problematic, top-down, non-consensual power dynamics in global development, and especially within development economics, cannot just be borne by one individual or even the human resources team in isolation. We all, as researchers here, have to be allies and, and own that as well. So as I work personally to set up CGD's new gender program, um, as I collaborate with colleagues working on global health and education and humanitarian assistance, what we want to do is re-examine our research process and think about how we can be more diverse and, and sustained in our partnerships, how we can make sure that our findings are shared in accessible and inclusive ways, and of course, there is a long road ahead, um, but we recognize that a pivotal part of this journey is listening to the voices of folks who have traditionally not been represented in this organization and in this sector. So with that, I'll just say that I am personally very excited to listen to and learn from our speakers today and many of you around the room. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Erin to lead the next part of the conversation. Okay, thank you. <laughs> hey, y'all. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Angela and Amanda. I wanted to actually um, ask what pronouns you use um, in the spirit of gender and gender justice. <laughs> so I identify as she, her. Um, I identify as her. Thank you. Um, so I'm Erin Gayan Andrea Mahefa. Uh, I use she, her, hers pronouns. I'll be the moderator today. Um, and again, I want to thank uh, Center for Global Development, PopWorks Africa, uh, Black Women in Development. Um, and I, I want to shout out to Elise Young, who pointed out to us um, uh, some accessibility needs uh, for to have our ASL interpreter here today. Um, you know, that's something that I'm still learning to consider for all of the events that we have, uh, that I'm part of. Uh, and of course, I want to thank Stephanie, Angela, and Nana um, for doing the work that they've been doing and speaking up about um, the work, um, yeah. that the work. Um, so I also want to name um, that, uh, that this will be, you know, live streamed and also recorded, uh, and the transcription of this will be available in a few days. Um, so in the spirit of consent, um, I want to acknowledge that we are currently on um, traditional Piscataway land. 
Um, and I want to acknowledge the indigenous people um, that have an enduring relationship uh, with this land. Um, and also, I want to acknowledge the labor of enslaved Africans that, um, that fundamentally contributed to the economic and structural economy of this country. Um, so, you know, I, I want to say that to ground us, to understand the longstanding history of, that has brought us here um, and, you know, encourage us to think about how, our place within that longstanding history and thinking about um, how a lot of that history was not consensual. Um, so with that, I want to uh, invite um, the speakers to introduce themselves, share their pronouns, and talk about how they came into this work. Hi, everyone. My name is Stephanie Kimu. I'm the founder and principal consultant at PopWorks Africa. My pronouns are she, her. And I started in this work because I'm an African woman, and I like to be of service uh, for people in my community. So good morning, everyone. My name is Angela Bruce Rayburn. My pronouns also she, her. And I wanted to work in this sector because I was born in Trinidad and Tobago. And I always wanted to work in a space that would help me to be able to contribute to how people in the Caribbean region of the world, how we lived, given the fact that it's, you know, some of countries are quite poor. And I always wanted to be a person that would be able to work in some, some way, shape, or form to, uh, to, to supporting uh, people in the Caribbean region. Hi, everyone. My name is Nana Dagadu. I also identify she, her, and hers. Um, I am in this space. I was born in Ghana and have always wanted to help people by being in the medical field in some way, shape, or form, I think, since I was a little girl, but I actually switched from the med school path uh, when I took an international health course in college as a, a junior, last minute turn that kind of irked my parents, unfortunately, but um, brought me into the public health sector. And I think bringing my past as a Ghanaian American, um, my dad was a diplomat, really just traveling the world has really inspired the work that I do um, and making me really conscious of thinking of different perspectives. Great, thank you. Um, so I guess I will explain, I will give you more detail about like who I am <laughs> and also talk about how I came into talking about consent within global development. Um, so I'm, um, I'm Malagasy and Chinese. So my father's from Madagascar and my mother is from China and I was born in Chicago, so I'm a Chicagoan. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I always conceptualized my existence within the global context, so I didn't have a choice within that. So seeing the connections of um, things that are happening globally really, can, I could not separate that from um, how I live my life, right? Um, and why um, the histories of my family, the history of my ancestors and my lineage. So, you know, thinking about career, international development at the time was, was something that allowed me to explore that. Um, and I focused on gender justice work and worked for various large-scale international development organizations and um, gender justice and women's empowerment organizations. But um, I, it was clear to me after a few years of working, um, I mean, studying and working that, you know, my, my identity, specifically as a queer woman of color in spaces, um, was not welcome or was not seen or... And, or not heard, right? And I think when we're talking about this work, um, it's so much, sometimes it's just so connected to our own identities. And for that to not be seen um, and not be recognized um, and to ha have the idea of expertise, right? Um, what is that? I, I think it's really, we need to think about like questioning what that really means. Um, so I think in terms of like my own journey of becoming more aware of, um, how the, how the field works, um, I left. I, I quit uh, my job and because uh, it was not good for my spirit. Um, and I currently work at a national nonprofit that supports immigrants, uh, immigrant survivors of gender-based violence, and I continue to volunteer with various organizations that, um, that support 
survivors of gender-based violence through an intersectional lens. Um, but you know, I still want to push forward this conversation. Um, and my work in gender-based violence very much um, informs this analysis. Um, so uh, you know, I'm very grateful to be able to provide this framework, but also you know, provide a container um, to lift up um, and center black women's voices and experiences. Um, so consent, right? Um, why consent? Why are we thinking about consent? Um, you know, I thought about how I think my, my understanding of consent kind of expanded when I um, started training um, to provide support on a hotline um, as an advocate for survivors of um, sexual violence. Um, and so we know the consent often within the sexual context, right? Um, we know with that definition, it's usually agreement to participate in sexual activity. Um, but more broadly, um, consent can be defined as um, giving permission or agreeing to, for something to happen. Um, and so we know that consent happens you know, in relationship. It requires communication. Um, it often requires, it can require some transparency, some vulnerability. Um, it could feel like um, saying yes or no without any consequences. Um, so you know, we also think about consent uh, alongside power. And we, we, well, we can't think about consent outside of power dynamics. Um, and you know, we can think about it as power within ourselves, power um, with others. And we can also think about it when we often think about it, it's power over somebody, right? Um, and when that happens, it's blurry. Consent is blurry. It's not clear. It's not obvious. Um, and so, you know, just for example, right, you are, it's late, you know, it's the end of the day and your boss has some, a new assignment for you and you are, you are swamped and, um, and, you know, depending on your relationship, how it, it would determine whether or not you would say yes or no to an assignment, right? Like that you, that you would be vulnerable enough to say, no, I'm, I am too, I'm too swamped right now. Um, or you would say yes, because it's, you know, because, you know, you're two weeks in your job and you really need to prove yourself. But it's blurry. Consent becomes blurry when there's power dynamics. And um, so we, thinking about that within the global development context, um, you know, there are so many power dynamics within global development and so many disparities and imbalances between the people um, that are in this work, right? Um, and so when we're thinking about the different relationships like local partner organization um, and the relationship with um, international NGOs, um, the, the, the way that we talk about beneficiaries um, and you know, even our relationship to those beneficiaries um, in Washington, D.C., um, and like, let's say the power that the CEO has um, in Washington, D.C. Uh, and the people, um, the, the local partners in, um, in country, right? Um, so just thinking about, let's say, an example for that, like when you're writing a $20 million uh, proposal and you are offering a local partner um, $500,000 uh, for a project that you have designed in Washington, D.C., um, how much power does a local partner to say have to say uh, that's actually not you know something that we want to do or not what we need, um, as opposed to just taking the five hundred thousand um, dollars to to survive right or to feed their families or to work. This is their job, right? Um, so recognizing that these are very unique within global development. Um, I want to also acknowledge that these relationships don't happen in a vacuum. Um, so, you know, like thinking about my own story, right? My own story and my family story does not happen outside of colonialism, imperialism, the racism, sexism, white supremacy, um, patriarchy, ableism, et cetera. Um, we can go on, yeah. um, but you know that's that's the experience that I bring, right? And and that's my own experience. So um, I want to invite everyone to think about how we've been conditioned to think about this work, and and why why we came into this work, how we do our work, um, and think about the many relationships about um, in terms of like who has power to really consent, um, and how individually we contribute to this larger system and uh, very much to the systems that 
like I just named, right? And more. Um, so in this conversation, um, I think it's really important for us to center black women. Um, I know you all are probably going to go back to your offices, and that's not going to be the norm, right? Um, so I want to name that, um, and I want to uh, provide the space to offer up um, this, uh, provide this offering. Um, so I'm going to ask specific questions um, to each of you, um, and and know that each of you really have a distinct perspective um, in your expertise as um, black women, mm -hmm. just that, and also your expertise within global development, right? Um, so um, I will start with you, Stephanie. Yeah. Um, so you have experience working with foundations and INGOs um, to design sexual reproductive health and rights programming. Um, with young black women throughout Africa. So how does, how does you know, consent show up and how do you work in the spirit of consent? Mm. Well, thank you for the intro. I think it was good framing. Um, I think the spirit of consent starts with me. Mm. So there are a couple of things I do when I enter a space where I have to develop intervention. So, the few months before a project starts, I usually come in and support locally rooted actors in framing what they want to do and how they want to do it. And so I think the first thing I do in terms of creating a spirit of consent is recognizing my levers of privilege, especially because I enter sub-Saharan African countries as an African woman, as an Ivorian American, but I also am a, I'm an American citizen, so I can move freely. Um, with my passport, I don't have an accent, so it's really mm -hmm. easy for people to understand what I'm saying and feel connected to what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. um, when I say people, I think those people who are in power in terms of international development work, which are usually white women. Mm -hmm. And so I also speak English really well, mm -hmm. um, sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> relatively. Um, I'm also, you know, have graduate education. I have proximity to whiteness that makes me disarming, mm -hmm. but also I can step out and say, you know, I'm a black woman and I stand in solidarity with black women. And so I'm, I'm able to move freely and I have to first recognize my levers of privilege because I can use that ag in a terrible world. I could use mm -hmm. those levers against the women who I'm working with and mm -hmm. you can't really develop consent without saying, this is how I can use my power against you and I recognize my power and I'm so sorry that I'm entering this space this way, but this is my truth. Mm. And so number one is recognizing my levers of privilege. Mm. Um, number two is honoring the work that's being done. And I really wanna specify honoring because I think in international development we recognize work that's being done but when you recognize work, you can also replace it very easily. Mm -hmm. And so I think honoring is an act of love that we can do when we enter a lot of international, formerly colonized nations is mm -hmm. saying, I see the work that you're doing, I've, I've read about it, I've done my due diligence to understand it, and I'm at service to you. And I'm not trying to replace or upgrade or create a 2.0 version. I'm really, mm. really just wanting to honor the work that African people are doing and humbly doing so. Um, and then I, I'm ensuring that these people have chosen to work with me, mm -hmm. which is really hard because of my clients sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. And the way, the way funding is set up in international development, usually, especially when you're a consultant, you're imposed upon a lot of populations, especially in Africa. Mm. And But I really try to make sure that these groups of women or young people even want to work with me and they've recognized my own value add because mm. there's no way I can tell them that. Right. Um, and then another thing that's difficult is giving all the information that I know to the populations mm -hmm. in which I'm working. But in a perfect world, if I could control that, it would be I'm sharing with the, the women or the young people I'm working with the origin story of this project because it never starts with them. Mm -hmm. It starts in DC or London or Paris. And so this is how it came to be. I would share as much about the budget as possible because how resources are allocated can build trust. And with trust comes cons a foundation for consent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then 
I always try to share what's next and possible iterations of the work after, which I think is really important because we can enter spaces knowing that you know we're doing this because it could lead to another $2 million from USAID. And mm -hmm. without the full picture, there's no way you can build trust and build that foundation of consent. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, recognizing my levers of privilege, honoring the work and not just recognizing it, ensuring that people have chosen to work with me, and giving as much information as possible mm -hmm. uh, within the constraints of my clients and the work. Mm -hmm. And so I do all of those things to try to enter the space before any discussions of developing the intervention or who the audience or the timeline as my own activism as a black woman. I, I know what it means to have things imposed upon me because of my color and my gender mm -hmm. and my origin. Um, and so I try to set that up. And I think it's really about building trust. All of those things are just trust in you. Like I said, lay trust on top of the foundation of consent and hope that all these things are like an offering to the people mm -hmm. that you're working with and hoping that they recognize your value and receive it in a way that doesn't make them feel disempowered. Because again, I'm a disarming black woman, woman who is easily trusted by white people. Mm. So that's a power. Yep. And so, yeah, hopefully that's clear. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. You. I really appreciated um, the way you uh, really emphasize trust mm. and building trust within within uh, you know the ways that we live in contradiction yeah. in some ways, right? It, living here in in DC or in the US. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, Angela, <laughs> um, I just want to say, like, Angela is one of the reasons why I am here. Yeah. Why I am here. Why everything exists. For real. Um, uh, so, um, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Honoring you. Yeah, honoring, yeah. Uh, honoring the people who that come before us. Okay. Um, oh, my not God. Too far not before. too far before. Not too far before. Okay. Um, <laughs> Although you could be my daughter, but okay. Uh, <laughs> So um, uh, we want to emphasize um, your work with Oxfam, um, with uh, with Oxfam when you were in Haiti during the earthquake in 2010, um, and you can talk about your other experiences also in global development in general. But you know, for specifically that that experience, like how did you rec reconcile delivering services in such a dire situation um, where consent from the local people is not clear and not asked for? Um, and um, providing, you know, doing your best to to support and provide what you could. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Yeah, you, the reality of the earthquake, of course. So can you you can imagine, right? Haiti is or has was already in very uh, poor circumstances before the earthquake. So the earthquake just exacerbated what was already a complex situation. So I I went to Haiti after the earthquake. Um, about six months after the earthquake. So it was a chaotic environment. So the, the beneficiaries, as we know that we refer to them, but the people who were really in need of assistance, we're talking at the beginning of the earthquake period, there was the humanitarian aspect of the work. So Oxfam, Oxfam and other organizations spent a lot of time and money on this humanitarian intervention, which the primary purpose of the humanitarian intervention was to save lives, right? So you're talking an earthquake happened, you're talking people people have died, uh, cleaning up, bringing water, food. It was a very chaotic time. But that time of humanitarian intervention, there's a bridge to when development actors start talking about development. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of blurry mm -hmm. in that area because mm -hmm. One minute you're talking saving lives, but everybody knows that that saving lives money mm -hmm. is going to dry up pretty soon, mm -hmm. and a lot of NGOs are going to stop pulling out, and there are going to be people who are going to be looking for assistance. So as an Oxfam person, so I'm the black woman coming from D.C. to Oxfam. Um, I was the black Caribbean woman. So I felt an additional responsibility because I'm from the Caribbean and Haiti is an important country in the Caribbean. Mm. So I'm thinking now I'm coming sort of also trusted and proximity to whiteness, right? I live in the US, I have 
several graduate degrees. I my French is pretty good, um, you know. So I'm going. I'm going. I'm going to be able to go into areas uh, in Haiti that. Haitian people at the time could not. Mm -hmm. I have also a U.S. passport. Mm -hmm. I could go to the U.N. compound. Mm -hmm. So there is such a, a division when you go into the U.N. compound and you drop your U.S. passport or your Canadian passport, mm -hmm. but you're not going to go with a Haitian passport mm -hmm. because there's a difference in the way you are received in this environment. Mm -hmm. So picture all the chaos and picture the humanitarian actors doing what they're doing, but knowing that money is about to run out. Mm -hmm. And so Oxfam is there to do work like programming things. So we're looking at water and sanitation. We're looking at housing. And it was at the time when the cholera outbreak happened in some parts of the country. So all of this is happening at the same time. And there is me, the black woman, trying to figure out how do I come and talk to people in this space? What, what are they seeing when they see me? Mm -hmm. Are they seeing that black lady that worked for Oxfam, mm -hmm. so no trust. Mm. Or are they gonna see me as the Caribbean person who is coming to them saying, I don't know anything about you all. Mm -hmm. Your country, I need you to teach me what I need to know. Mm -hmm. How are they perceiving my, my, my involvement in this? Mm. So there was obviously no consent at the time because mm. it was, if you remember after the earthquake, just stuff just coming in the country, right? Uh, people sending things. And, you know, there was even a point when, the, um, when people were saying that don't send any clothes, don't send any old shoes, mm -hmm. don't send Haitian people all this stuff because, A, they don't want it right now. Mm -hmm. B, it's difficult to figure out in, amidst the chaos mm -hmm. what to do. So while people think that they're doing great, those people have not consented to any of this. Mm -hmm. They are really in survival mode. Mm -hmm. So I spend a lot of my time trying to be the Caribbean person. Yeah. Uh, talking to them, trying to learn a little bit of Creole, be able to uh, use the common things that we had, which was that I was black and I was a woman and I was working in a space where there were a lot of women. And I felt that that was my entree mm -hmm. into that situation. Mm -hmm. And it was the only way I felt that they would like me, listen to me, mm -hmm. even think what I was saying was of any importance. Mm -hmm. Because in that time, it was all about survival, mm. right? And Oxfam had a lot of, you know, ideas, big ideas about programming. But one of the negative things for me was that when I walked into that first time, I walked into that office at Oxfam uh, Great Britain, uh, because at the time I worked for Oxfam America, so I need to be very clear because I see my Oxfam friends over there. <laughs> I don't want them to be mad at me. Um, no, but I worked for Oxfam America, and I went into the office in Oxfam Great Britain, and the most stark memory of that moment was walking into this beautiful office, and it was almost all white, mm. almost all expats, almost all. Ox, um, Oxfam and Great Britain, Oxfam International, Ox, they sent a ton of young, mostly white women to, to Haiti who um, spoke not great French, for example, um, who just finished a graduate degree, had a one-week internship at State Department or something, and these people were now the experts. Mm. And that is the part that I really want to emphasize about how you're talking, you're a 25-year-old woman who just graduated from Georgetown or American or whatever, and you're in a country, and you're talking to people about how they're going to get water or how they're going to survive after an earthquake as though you have any expertise in this area. Mm. And they are not consenting to you being there. They mm. are not. In fact, they resent it in many ways. Mm. And so I really walked into that office and recognized that it was almost all white, and the other thing that was interesting was that there would be these meetings where people would, you know, mostly, again, most of the expats, they're in a closed door and the Haitians are outside. Mm. And that also was my real realization that what we were doing there was not helpful, mm. not consensual in any way. And, and so now I'm the black woman and I now feel that I have to challenge this, right? I have mm. to say something because, of course, all the other black people are looking at me, mm. and they're like, uh-huh, look at her. <laughs> she, you know, she wanted them. Right. And I was, it was weird for me mm. in, in Haiti at that moment. And, um, and so I, I realized that my only path 
into this conversation was to develop a relationship with the people, the country director, uh, who was a Haitian woman, and really work with her to show her that I was, I cared about this issue and that I was not here to put Haiti on my resume. Mm. I, I tell people all the time, Haiti is the greatest resume builder you will ever find. Uh -huh. <laughs> because when you put that you were in Haiti, people are like, oh, you must know something, right? Mm. Um, and so that was my experience. And I worked on building trust. I worked on uh, sharing commonality, right? Mm. I was black. I'm from the Caribbean. I understand what it is like to live in a part of the world where things are difficult. Yeah. And even though I live in the States now, yeah. I understand what that means. And that mm -hmm. opened up a whole world of um, people wanting to talk to me. And I feel that that's how I was able to work in Haiti without, without you know, really going crazy at, at, mm -hmm. at the time of the earthquake. Can I say something about yes. what Angela's um, shared is just like our blackness is a really huge asset in international yeah. development, which is why black women are so pivotal to international development and shouldn't be tokenized and, and used in a weird way because mm -hmm. um, our blackness is, uh, legitimizes us mm -hmm. and we can't yes. let anyone cut that down. Mm -hmm. And it's really easy to get that cut down when you work in an international NGO in the U.S. because you are a black person in service of black people led by white people for mm. the most part. And mm -hmm. that's already like, oh, I'm embarrassed. Yeah. Like, oh, like, yeah, I don't know yeah. how to deal with this, right, you know? Right, right. And so it's yeah. just, it's, it's so, so anxiety inducing mm -hmm. to it's be so black, a woman, to enter black spaces with white teams. Mm. It, it automatically delegitimizes any work that you do on consent. Mm -hmm. And so it, it is like, Distancing yourself yeah, a little sure bit is. and becoming an island of blackness to ensure that you can build sure. that. An island of blackness. <laughs> 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 yeah, Thank, Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think I really like when you were saying, um, Angela, like, you know, as much as people believe and feel like they're doing good things, like, I think we should really think about consent um, in that way. Mm -hmm. um, because you know that's why we that's why we essentially got in, went into this field right we wanted to do good things mm -hmm. good do things do good and things. it's like what does that what really look like yeah. and feel like for the people that we are trying to support mm. Absolutely. Yeah. um so thank you angela yeah, um nana <laughs> so you have over a decade of, of experience in developing co and comprehensive monitoring and evaluation frameworks um, for programs in Africa. Um, so how do you navigate your work while practicing consent? How does it show up? Thanks. That's a, that's a question that I think I've struggled with um, for a long time. I, as an evaluator, as a researcher, you're already coming in as an outsider mm -hmm. often. And so this is a very... Um, critical piece, I think, right from the start, and how you navigate the initial dialogues and conversation, I think, sets the tone for everything that you do. I think in my experience um, at several different INGOs um, and then supporting local organizations, I find myself as sort of a, in the in-between space, I like mm -hmm. to call it, mm -hmm. and I have to figure out um, pivoting in different ways. So I think of it in a, maybe two main ways. The first is as a person brought in to set up a system often, you know, a monitoring system, evaluation, or sort of design a study. Um, am I taking the time to know that particular context? Mm -hmm. So I cover multiple countries right now, but I have to essentially take off my hat from the previous experience and wear a new hat. Mm -hmm. I have to read, I have to learn, and have conversations with um, the field staff that are actually in this country. Mm -hmm. um, I may not always get to work directly with project participants, and so I have to be really conscious of engaging um, the country teams, who they are, what they think the issues are, and what they think um, is needed to really create a, a robust system that will actually serve their needs and not just look good mm -hmm. in a proposal, mm -hmm. right? I think we can write a lot about what evaluation and learning and research should be, but when you get down to the ground, what is really feasible is not always considered. If people are um, in hardship context, what are they going to be able to get? Do you need 60 indicators? 
Probably not. You maybe need one or two, right, mm -hmm. to get you through the key point. It's not how fancy your survey looks or, you know, how cre um, creative is not the word, how complex your design is, right? You want to have all the cool methods thrown into one study. But really it's about what are people willing, able, um, and eager to handle. So I think that's often a conversation I find myself having to be the pause button um, with the team and headquarters, right? Mm -hmm. So have you talked to the field team? What do they think? And can we talk to other project participants who have experienced our work and who know the context as well? What do they feel would help them in this case? What questions can we ask and not ask, right? I think that's really important. What are people willing to answer? And not because you know it might be a sexual health project where people are embarrassed, et cetera. But what are they? What's culturally appropriate to ask and and discuss? And I think that doesn't always come up in the conversation. And mm -hmm. at times, I feel like I have to be the the bad person, right? Where you're saying, "Slow down. Mm -hmm. We can write this. I can sit and write, you know, ten pages of a evaluation plan for a proposal." but it won't be useful to the people on the ground. Mm. So that's sort of on, on one hand. I think on the other hand, I'm also this pivot um, with staff that are on existing projects. So where we are trying to collect data, right? And ensure data quality. Mm -hmm. This is always a, a thing and people are concerned, right? We don't want them sitting under trees and filling out the questionnaire. We want, actual, like, we want it to actually happen. Okay, how do we, how do, we do that? So it's then coming alongside my colleagues who are the ones actually collecting the data, right? I don't go and collect the data. I often don't even speak the actual local language. I speak French, but I don't speak Bambara or any other of those local languages. So I have to like work with my um, colleagues in the field. And often it's, what do you need to be able to do your work, right? What skill can I share with you um, I often take with me uh, research journals, right, that I subscribe to here that I can easily access. I share those in, in country. What's the latest information? A lot of um, our research uh, officers want to know, like, what's out there? What should we not be doing? What should we be doing? What are others doing? And so I really like to say, hey, have you guys in Kenya heard about what the Mali team is doing? Mm -hmm. This might be helpful for you. And so I'm always on the lookout for bringing people together and making it something that they can pick and choose from themselves. Mm -hmm. And so I provide a menu that they can select from rather than saying, you have to do this, this is the right way to do it, mm -hmm. and allowing space for them to kind of select that. And I think that's a way that I navigate that because again, as a black woman, I'm also working, while I'm working with white women and men here in the field, I'm often working with black men. Mm. Right, and so I have to figure out that consent yeah. as well. And I just wanted to—I know we've talked a lot of black women, but I think there's an important consideration that my my compatriots are also black men mm -hmm. in African countries mm -hmm. often, and there's a dynamic there Absolutely. as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Thank you for naming that. Yep. Um, yeah, I really liked how you. I think about this all the time. Like when I used to do proposal development, so like. Writing, you know, hundred-page proposals. It's like, who is this accessible to? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, um, sixty indicators. Why? <laughs> uh, I mean, for real though. Or more. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like yeah. they're. I mean, essentially, if we're thinking about like needing to have things um, recorded and all yeah. written in this specific way, it's like, what is this really trying? What are we really trying to do here? Mm -hmm. um, but I really liked when you mentioned. Um, you know, your your role in kind of bringing people together and providing a choice, providing, um, leaving space for people to actually choose something. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is consent practice, yeah. for sure. Um, so with that, thank you, Nana. Um, we're going to go and do something different. Um, I'm going to leave my seat. We're going to spend probably 15 minutes um, uh, in the next this next phase of this um, event. So we're going to try to change the dynamics of kind of expertise. Um, you know, these women here are not the only experts in this room. Um, and we want to acknowledge that 
we are experts in our own experience. Um, and we're really trying to model that shift here, um, but also for me to leave this seat. And we're going to try to do this. So this seat will have a mic. Um, we're going to open it up to the audience, specifically black women in the audience, um, to speak on, we're going to have, it's going to be a conversation um, up here. Um, it's, we're going to speak to these questions. So I'm going to read them out loud. What are the root causes of non-consensual relationships within development? Um, what do you think contributes to contributes most to these non-consensual relationships? From your experience as a black woman in this work, what would consent what, what would consensual global development look and feel like to you, and what needs to shift? Um, so, yeah, you know, I'm going to open up this seat, and it's going to be, we want it to be very fluid, right? So we want people from the audience to come and um, come in and out of the conversation as they please. Um, and we want to, it's going to be like water, you know? We, we don't want a line. <laughs> we don't want a line, like, forming necessarily, like, t you know, be mindful of kind of who's coming in out of space, but also, um, I you know, we don't want to also be necessarily um, uh, disruptive or anything. So you can come. You don't need to have, have anyone finish their sentence or anything to come and go, mm -hmm. right? Um, and at the same time, um, I also <coughs> encourage folks who wouldn't um, normally come up into the seat <laughs> to join in the conversation yeah. um, to. You know, maybe take a risk today. Maybe take a risk today. Um, and at the same time, I also want to value the different ways that we contribute and the ways that we want to be seen and heard. Maybe it's not speaking in this seat. Um, and you know, trust that. Trust that. Like, you don't need to be up here. Um, and you have experts sitting around you. Um, and also, listening is also a way to participate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Um, so great. So um, I will let you know if you're the last person because we're going to also go into Q and A after 15 minutes. So I'll let you know when we're when you're going to be the, if you're the last person in the seat, and then we'll transition into Q and A. Um, but with that, emphasize that yeah, this is the seat is for Black women. The seat is for Black women. We're centering Black women's voices and experiences today. Decolonizing the we're, panel. We're decolonizing the panel. So, so this is your mic. Um, and you know, be mindful of how much space you take up in the seat because you also want to make room for other black women. Ooh. Just, just a thought. Wow. Just a thought. Um, so we want to be fluid. We don't need to finish, you know. Um, but I encourage um, Stephanie, Angela, and Nana to feel free to talk about whatever you really want. Um, you can, these are guiding questions. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Right. Who's up down. first? <laughs> No pressure. Maybe no we pressure. Should start with, um, what are the root, the root causes, causes of yeah. non-consensual yeah, relationships yeah. and global yeah. development? Yeah. Welcome, sister. Thank yeah. you. Welcome to you all. My name is Sia. And, Which question do you um, want to talk about? My goodness. Well, the first one really jumps out at me. First, I want to just welcome you. Um, hi, Meg, and thank Meg <laughs> for inviting me here. I come from the Anacostan region of DC, um, which is in Southeast. Uh, that's where I live. For those who don't know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and yes, yeah, sometimes being a black woman presents a little bit differently. Um, mm. But the root cause <laughs> of mm. non-consensual, in my experience, really is genocide. Mm. If we look around at um, our policies and how we interact with each other, we have become less violent as a society. But we have to be mindful of you know, these ideas like sending clothes or something. Mm -hmm. How does it actually affect our day-to-day -day survival? Because a lot of us really are just on that day-to-day -day survival. Day -day. And it's like, you know, new shoes would really help me get to the store or whatever, but if there's no food in the store, where mm. am I going? Mm. Um, but yeah, so that's the main thing I wanted to address. And I wanted to ask you ladies, really what is um, the idea or what is our end game, our goal in terms of globalization? Like you spoke, Nana spoke about this idea of um, cultural competence and um, and, and when you go through the different indicators, I'm not in, in, in <laughs> any nonprofit work right now. I actually teach yoga. Um, I've stepped all the way out of it. I love it. Um, yes. 37 years in DC from the Anacostan region, you just, you kind of get tired. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> and self care is very much, important. it's a little plug, but self care is important for activists. Um, but mm. when you speak about cultural competence and you know whether or not it's taboo to um, you know talk about sexual violence or something like that when you're going through your different indicators, mm. Um, it is taboo, but why are we here? What are we doing? What is um, what is the goal of your research? And maybe 
we need to make it less taboo because mm -hmm. we do need to speak on it. I come from a West Indian family, okay? And we, yeah. not, we don't talk, we about, don't nothing. talk about that. <laughs> nothing, yeah. okay, right? Yeah. And so when, um, when, we, when we come together in these spaces, my question to you ladies in, in the same right is, what, what are we doing? Mm. And, and why are we I doing it? <laughs> I think I, I, I have gonna, my, oh, sorry, I'm gonna go, write ahead, down go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. And then I think we can do it during the Q&A. Yeah. We just wanna make sure other women can answer yes, some sure. of these yeah, questions. So okay, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. We yeah, see ya. Ah, <laughs> thank you. Um, and feel free, ladies, to come up. But oh. I kind of want to talk about the root causes of non-consensual relationships within global development. I recently saw a meme that said, everything is because of colonization. You're depressed because of colonization. <laughs> You're hungry because of colonization. <laughs> and so I kind of have internalized that. I think that's kind of my mantra. But I think non-consensual relationships is rooted in the fact that Africa, anywhere where there are black and brown people has, has been totally destroyed by violence and racism, like you said, genocide, against yeah. the black body, against black women. And what was left after something like the Berlin Conference was all these new countries and new ideologies and new religions that really tried to eradicate or wipe away things that existed in Africa before. And so what was replaced was a system of white supremacy, that whiteness was good, blackness was bad, whiteness is more intelligent, whiteness is more valuable, attractive. And more attractive, more visually appealing. And so it's not a stretch to say colonization has created the international development sector in its shadow, mm -hmm. and that a lot of the racism that came from colonizing entire nations it has trickled down into the way we hire, into the way we monitor and evaluate, into the way we treat local staff. It's just, mm -hmm. I think there's a direct connection. You can see that really clearly. Mm -hmm. So I think anything that has to do with non-consensual relationships is rooted in um, colonization, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I agree to the extent that, you know, recently I had written something, an article, um, and it, it was uh, on DevEx a few months back. Mm. And I got a lot of people asking me about some of the comments that I made. And in fact, I referenced a, a, a gentleman who I did not know. He had written an article. Uh, um, he had written an article in the newspaper of, in England. And I had referenced his, his article because he was writing to say that he was in a meeting at Oxfam in England somewhere. And he was a white guy. And apparently he's married to a Trinidadian woman. Mm. So he married to a sister. Mm. Anyway, Cute. so so of course, right? So I already said, okay, you got taste. <laughs> um, but anyway, he, um, he he had written this article. And in his article, he said he was in a meeting and they were talking about Sierra Leone and about Ebola centers. And mm. he said that someone got up in the meeting and said, I don't want to be politically incorrect, uh, but... But of course, you know when someone says but that, they're going to be all right. Right, 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 right there. So the person said in the meeting in, in the UK about Sierra Leone, the person said, I don't want to be politically incorrect, but isn't it the problem that Africans just don't know how to manage infrastructure? And he was offended by this question and said, what is happening? And I guess a light bulb went off in his head where he thought, that's racist. That's what do you mean, <laughs> Africans don't right? That's yeah. what this guy's thinking. Yeah. So he writes this article. I read the article, and I read it, and I feel irritated because I feel I've been saying that all the time. <laughs> I know everybody's. Right. I know tons of women who yeah. say this all the time. Yeah, but too much. You yeah, say it too much. Yeah, what is? Why is too loud? Why is your <laughs> comment all of a sudden just out the blue like the valuable thing and he had so many responses so I was a little irritated by that so I wrote this article and I submitted it to DevEx and it was published and apparently he got a lot of commentary and he told me he had to change his name um, from the article because he got so many people commenting to him about my article mm. but I just wanted to say to him in, the art, in my article I said if it's not racism then what is it if a, international aid is about thinking about what you need, figuring out how to give it to you, not asking you what you need, then figuring out the mechanism to deliver what you need, yeah. then find a researcher and evaluator 
yep. to evaluate how, how you, you did. did with what you needed, yep. according to them. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right? It's yep. a it's a it's a massive system mm -hmm. that just goes in a cycle. Big cycle. And you're like, wait a minute. So, of course, someone is going to say, um, "Is Africans can't take care of in, um, mm -hmm. infrastructure?" Because what you're missing in that whole thing is this structure that was created. Did they ask you for it? Did you discuss about how sustainable it was going to be? How do you know that they could even have maintained it after you left yep. with the resources they, they have? How in this whole conversation did you get mm. to this point? Mm -hmm. So I feel that the, 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 the way we contribute to these non-consensual relationships is by the fact that we have this massive system that's out of control. Mm. I think that the international development industry is completely out of control. Absolutely. Because at the end of the day, what you get is yeah, yeah. educated people, educated in the U.S., in Europe, mm. they go to these countries with all their education, and they have no idea what's going on. Mm. And then they get paid more. Way more. They mm. get paid way more. Way more. They get, they get things like... <laughs> um, Please join, yeah, us. please join yeah, us. Please join us. Please. I mean, it creates it creates this this culture of necessity, also, right? right? Like right. it's like right. you are put, making people feel indebted, or mm. in mm. some cases, like you were yes. saying, Sia. Yes. Cons like it's 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 this Ooh. indebted. I it's necessary for me to survive. Mm. Therefore, what choice do I have? Absolutely, I have no choice. Right. I'm going to right. take your money and do the best that I can, right? I will try and write the grant how you want it, what are your buzzwords that you need to put. I mean, Ooh. I have literally worked with local organizations like, you have to say this word, mm -hmm. and you have to say this word, mm -hmm. that's your best chance, mm -hmm. because to get what you want and what you need. And mm -hmm. so the necessity is almost, it's handicapping in a lot mm -hmm. of ways, right? Like, and even me personally, I will be very honest, as an employee in organizations, there are times when I do what I must Absolutely. to get what I need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so imagine if me on a micro level, right, as an individual, and then you have communities on a bigger level, they have to check their list also, mm -hmm. right? And so this, the root cause is, you, how can you escape from that right. if you are not even heard or allowed to, right. to say system, what it is uh, that yeah. you need? Right. Yeah. Welcome. Hello. Thank you for your refreshing um, comments mm -hmm. and raise taking out from our personal corners of uh, support and discussion amongst black women who, yes, work in development, but that continuum of development is not only in Africa. I was very pleased mm. to hear uh, our young lady mm -hmm. come and be first yeah. from Anacostia because I volunteer in Anacostia. Yeah. I'm on a board in Africa and I'm on a corporate mm. board, couple of corporate boards here mm. in the USA. Mm. So let's, uh, let's talk about this on a continuum, mm -hmm. and thank you for bringing this discussion to the open. I think in response to what is at the root, um, and you mentioned some meeting in Brussels or Belgium <laughs> or someplace, <laughs> there is a distinct deep discount, and I am a finance person, so I will talk in finance terms, mm -hmm. deep discount of the truth that built the Southern Hemisphere mm -hmm. riches, mm -hmm. which have been plundered mm -hmm. by the Northern Hemisphere. Mm -hmm. There is an absolute disrespect for what, what it has taken us to get to where we were discovered. Mm -hmm. When the development business was launched with the establishment of, of the Bretton Woods. The intention was, had nothing to do with the Southern Hemisphere. It had everything to do with peers across the Atlantic, rebuilding Europe. The true name of the World Bank is the, here, yeah. say, International Bank of Reconstruction and Development. And it is only when the returns from doing that work of rebuilding mm. Europe, that instead of shutting it down, closing it shop, became, yeah. job done, celebrating that, <laughs> that they turn to the West, to the Southern Hemisphere, mm -hmm. where there is a misalignment of, <laughs> of cultures. Mm -hmm. In the North, it's the individual. Mm. 
-hmm. I don't know one person who comes from the Southern Hemisphere who is of color who believes they won, as we say in the Caribbean, met the dance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this notion of it coming with a village, for a village, mm. today and in the future, is what we are all raised on. Mm -hmm. So this misalignment, we have to have one man, one vote. One person, need, one man, let's be Wait, clear, one. needs to own the <laughs> yeah. land, okay? One, and so there is no way that we are going to move forward without respect for what the beneficiaries give to these projects mm -hmm. for free while they are not doing right. their daily work. Mm -hmm. Yes, of not only being an employee, but being a farmer, of being an entrepreneur. Of, we have not counted them as assets. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we have, I, I can talk clearly ad finitum on what the root is. I'd like to put forward um, some thinking and encourage us mm. to talk about one, does development need to continue to exist mm. in the form that we have discovered it? Ooh. Mm -hmm. That part. Uh, it's just a question. <laughs> <laughs> does develop and two, this whole thrust be behind entrepreneurship, women, youth. Who in development really has chops in private sector governance and investment to run with that? Mm. Or are we selling them cold porridge? Ooh. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Wow. Um, I think maybe that lady, we'll go. Lady. Oh, one yeah. lady, one more lady over here. And then we'll go to the next question. Yeah, we'll go to Q&A and the questions oh, go I was to asked. Q&A. Okay, welcome. Hi. Hi, good morning. My name is Boosie, um, and I just want to piggyback on a couple of points that you lovely ladies made, mm -hmm. and also this lovely woman. Um, my background in international development mainly focuses on business development, proposal mm -hmm. management. Mm -hmm. So for me, when I think about what contributes the most to non-consensual relationships, it's the patriarchal donor culture mm -hmm. and this like the core of international development, unfortunately, especially being in DC, being at HQ, mm -hmm. is money. Mm -hmm. So I'm constantly looking at pipelines and you know what's our win rate and how can we bring in more work and oh this project is going to end in six months so now let me hop on a plane and go to Egypt and see you know how we can position ourselves to win the next project as opposed to really thinking okay what did we actually achieve yeah. who are the partners that we're working with who are the staff that we need to retain you know what do they really bring of value when we're reading the the midline and the end line mm, <laughs> reports <laughs> You know, and I find myself, I was really um, appreciative of you ladies speaking about being a black woman and being a woman of education and, you know, clear addiction, how that puts you in a space where, you know, you're surrounded by white VPs, directors, senior vice presidents. They look at you as like that comforting, soothing voice in the room, even though you're the only black woman in the room. And you may be, in, I find myself typically being the youngest black woman in the room and the one with the smallest title. Mm -hmm. But I also have a mouth on me, so <laughs> I tend to say the most about, okay, this is wrong, like why are we sending people who speak Spanish to Haiti? Because yeah. I have that on my resume as well. Okay. They're like, oh, it's close to French, they'll be fine. I'm like, yeah. okay, no. no. They want to send Israelis to Egypt, and yeah. I'm like, also probably a terrible idea. <laughs> But they're just like, we we need to win this project. So you know, just let's just clobber somebody's resume together and, and Boosie, you know, you'll fix it. You'll you'll make it read exactly like the proposal needs to read. And I'm just, I'm in a place in my career where I'm just thoroughly depressed mm. by the the way that the donors see the beneficiaries, the way that the donors see the work. Because obviously, you know, in grad school, you learn about do no harm. Yeah. No and that's what you're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you come into the real world and you're like, okay, what are we really going to achieve in three years? I thought it was like five to 10 years before you can really see impact. Mm -hmm. But you never see a five year project where you like really are implementing for five it's years. It's not realistic. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, it's not realistic. And you're, at all. and you're giving yeah. local partners the actual budget that they need yeah. to do the work that they need to do. Mm -hmm. So for me, I just feel like the donors, I don't know if we're ever going to get them to understand what it really takes to have sustainable long-term change in country mm -hmm. that is owned, mm -hmm. that um, 
focuses on the most vulnerable parts of any given community that is not centered around we need to win this $50 million project right. because we need to make sure that we can give everybody bonuses in December. Yeah, thank you so wow. much. Thank you so much. Wow. Could you share your name? I know we're going to. Could you two share your name, actually? Boosie and Boosie. Boosie. Yeah. Boosie and yeah. Joyce. Joyce. Thank you. Thank um, you, Boosie I, and Joyce. I know we're going to Q&A. Yeah. But I just wanted to wrap up this section. We got to one question. Black women. Black we, women. We, we, we put a lot in there. <laughs> um, but I wanted to say that I was recently reading about how decolonization is an act of love. And when you enter spaces that you say you love and you care about and you want to not do harm, you want to make sure people in the community are elevated, you want to make sure you're shrinking yourself, mm. you want to dismantle white systems of oppression, you want to dismantle white supremacist tools of monitoring, mm. all these things, it's like it's an act of love. And I don't want that to be forgotten because I feel often very depressed and hopeless about the sector, but. I think there is um, a window of opportunity for everyone in this room to act in love for the places where you say you want to work. Mm -hmm. And acting in love is leaving it, uh, if you're working in Africa, more black than when you arrived, more centered on black people and black cultures and black expertise. And it's all so doable. Like, I, I don't want to jump in and be an idealist because that's not really me. but. I also want to emphasize that like an action point we can all take away is to really, when you enter a, a culture in a country, act like you love that place, like that you're honoring these people. Be humble. Be I humble. Mean, Be humility. Humble. <laughs> Please join us. Sorry, I know we're I'm doing exactly Aaron, the opposite. Just... <laughs> Water. I typically don't like to speak in front of a, a large audience, but something you, you said. You look ready, though. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You do. I'm just smelling good, like For sure. sure. <laughs> but something you said resonated with me. Acting in love, going mm. into in country and acting in love, and it's in acting in love that I've actually taken out a sabbatical. Mm. I've been in mm. human resources as a talent acquisition consultant for over 15 years, and I recently just stopped work. I'm taking a sabbatical because mm. I want to join a cause that I'm truly passionate about, mm -hmm. and which is helping widows and female victims of emotional abuse. Mm. Mm. As a widow myself, mm. if I had the funds to go into Nigeria, my, I'm from England, born and raised, I'm British, mm. but my family is Nigerian. If I had the funds to go into Nigeria and help the widows, I know exactly what they would need mm. because I've lived that life as a widow in Nigeria before mm. going back to England and, and now the US. Mm. So it's very important to act in love and then work towards something you're passionate about, but then really find out what the people are needing. What do they need? Mm -hmm. What do the widows need? Mm -hmm. What do their children need? And then providing them and meeting them at their exact point in need, as opposed meeting to all them. these protocol yeah. and proposals and whatever. Go straight to the point and provide exactly mm -hmm. what's going to make impact to the women. Mm. Yes. So yeah. that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. What's your name? All right. Oh, your name. Yeah. yeah. What's your name? Patricia Uche Chiemeka. Yeah. Very Patricia. nice. <laughs> We have one more. Oh, one more. Yes, yeah. yes, come on. Come, come on, on Devo. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. I think um, everyone who was up here before has said, you know, really gotten to the heart of the issue. And what, and I think, you know, really touched on the root cause. One of the other things, though, I just wanted to add on um, to this conversation and for everyone to go away and think about in terms of, in, you know, in the work that they're doing is a lot of a lot of this also persists because you know it's kind of like Chimamanda Adichie said you know the, the danger of a single story yeah. we're conditioned to view the beneficiaries one way yes. as these helpless kind of like children who don't know any better mm -hmm. and you know we were coming in you know with a certain amount of education and you know, just because we know how to work on an Excel spreadsheet, we somehow think we can solve, you know, mm -hmm. problems of water well, sanitation in country yeah. X. Mm. And the thing is, expertise, you know, that's gained here, for example, people, as, as, as you said about being humble, people really need to think, does this actually apply in that mm. context? Mm. Just because I know something here. You, it, people mm. don't recognize enough that that expertise has behind it a lot of systems and you know mm. things that have nothing to do with you directly <laughs> that have got, you know have have contributed yeah. to that mm. and then you're going to go into a totally foreign 
context okay. and say, yes, I know how to fix X. You don't. Mm. This is beyond you. Mm. You don't know what you're doing. Ooh. Because that's just beyond <laughs> us. <laughs> um, and the other thing I just wanted to add to that, too, is that, you know, for, for me, I, I don't I, I'm always... I think history is very important. Mm -hmm. I think context is exceptionally important. And if we're honest, some of us, you know, frankly, whether, you know, so sometimes it's lack of interest, sometimes it's lack of time. We don't mm -hmm. take into account all of these ex other additional power dynamics that mm -hmm. contribute to whatever little piece of the development puzzle we're working on. Mm -hmm. It goes more, it goes far beyond, you know, health issue X. There are so many social and economic issues that led to that, and often also to do with foreign policy, dare I say it. Yes. And I know, and this is this is what I think is very tricky with the kind of work we do, because obviously we want to get those government contracts and things like that. But we have to check, you know, also ask, is the foreign policy of the countries we work for also contributing to the situation where <sighs> countries is. are it kept is. in a system, system where they're consistently need, needing yeah. This mm -hmm. help. Yeah. Yes. And so, yeah. anyway, so I just yeah. wanted to add that. Thank, Thank you. Yay, Thank you, Devo. <laughs> okay. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure we have time for like one question. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be that bad. Maybe two. Yeah, it's five minutes to die. <laughs> <laughs> I think someone behind okay. you. Oh, is there a microphone? Is there? A, I can. Oh, yeah. I have a oh. question. Is this is question and answer, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Question and answer. Okay. Hello. My name is Habtamu Buli. I'm from Ethiopia. First, I want to thank everyone here for taking this uh, opportunity to provide the event on inclusion, including me. I see so much diversity here. It's very inspiring, and I really appreciate that. But still, I see a big gap where uh, I'm not seeing people with disabilities, mm. and especially women with disabilities, mm. uh, involved in these conversations. Uh, when we're looking at gender and disability and identity, that's another aspect that I'm not seeing. Mm. And we still see, even in this room, we don't see black women who are disabled mm. at the table. There's, they're not in the panel. And that hap has happened for a long time. And I appreciate FHI 360, who's been working on disability and inclusion and allowing people with disabilities to lead the conversation and to mentor rather than just to be helped. And this is something uh, that we want to find ways to work through and create more systems to, to allow this to us to be a voice. So these are issues that I'd like to discuss. And uh, when we come try to figure out solutions as to how we can be allies, um, and often the system of powers are uh, not, uh, you know, the people with disabilities are not understanding those powers and yeah. systems, and yeah. so we are not able to create our own uh, involvement in those discussions. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for naming that. Um, it's really important, and I think there's always room to do better, right? Mm -hmm. um, we here are not the end of a conversation. We should never believe that we are the end of a conversation. Um, and would love to build with you on, on um, if you consent, right? We also, don't <laughs> want to, we also want to acknowledge the, the labor, right, it takes um, to speak up and name things that are happening that are harming other folks. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for sharing, and we will definitely um, think to do better next time. Uh, Angela? I just, yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, when we get together, sometimes we, we talk about all our problems, and then it gets to the point where you, maybe you feel overwhelmed, and then you think, well, what is the solution, right? And that is a hard place to also be, mm -hmm. and I don't want us to leave, um, you know, with that feeling of like, oh my God, international development is so terrible. Because at the end of the day, it has its problems and we, we have to be honest about that. Mm -hmm. But I think that one of the areas that we really think a lot about is about at the leadership table in many organizations, there are no women of color and certainly no, no. black women. Yeah. And we have to not pretend, that we have to realize that that's a real issue. You cannot come into my part of the world 
whether that's Southeast DC, mm -hmm. or whether it's Trinidad and Tobago, or whether it's Cote d'Ivoire, mm -hmm. with, without acknowledging that there are people there, or people with expertise there, who know more than you. Mm -hmm. Mm. And we yeah. consistently do it. We do it all the time. So I would just like to say that one of the things in the article that I had written, I said, and I got a lot of negative comments for it, was that I said that I think that international organizations cannot have all white leadership. I'm sorry, it cannot. Yeah, you're not sorry. And <laughs> uh, right? I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. You're not I'm sorry. Not sorry. I, it, it cannot. And you can look, you can go right now online and look up a lot of organizations in the, in the in the US and across where there are you look at the across leadership the you look at the leadership team and you see maybe three white women and two white men or you might you know and i look at this and i think how is it that there is not one african person that could talk about africa or you know or <laughs> i don't understand it so i feel like one of the challenges that we face is the fact that at the leadership table, you don't see a lot of w women, you don't see a lot of women of color, and black women are the, no. the, the, the least of the group. And I think that's partly because of all the other social issues mm -hmm. that, you know, black women are angry, yeah. and black women are crazy, and black women are loud, or yeah. what all the things hey, that, all the isms that, you know, that they always <laughs> late. Um, <laughs> you know, all the things that we struggle with and then and, and trying to maintain a professional selves. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a lot to, to deal with. And I just wanted to say that we have to also name, name that. As mm -hmm. one of our, as one of the challenges that we face and in the sector, right, yeah. right. Do we want to take one more? One question? more question, yeah, and one I know. Question. CGT is like, no, these people. This woman behind you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm waiting. Oh, sorry. Yes. I think there's someone in. <laughs> um, hello, my name is Sarah. I'm from the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation, Hi, and I just want to start by saying thank you so much. I feel very grateful to be a listener in this conversation, and I will carry this with me wherever I go. So thank you to everyone who's spoken. Um, so I work in communications at EGPATH, and we are predominantly an African organization, and we do really want to use our communications to elevate and highlight and respect and honor the experiences of our health workers, of the people who benefit from our services, while also acknowledging that the history of international development organizations communicating those stories is largely exploitative. Yeah. Um, and so I was just wondering if any of you had insight on how we can continue that effort to do this in, in the right way, um, in a way that is really honoring and really respectful and really, um, I don't want to use the word empowering, but, yeah. but, yeah. but does really honor and respect and thank the people for participating. Yeah. Um, and and stay away from the like transactional nature that mm -hmm. that kind of has historically. Thank you. Um, I guess I can start. I I think we all get this question a lot about how to like decolonize certain spaces to ensure that they're authentic. I don't I don't think it's possible unless you have African Black people on staff that are supporting you. There's no way to be authentic and true and truly honor the systems without support from people who are from of that community. And I think it's easy to hire local staff to do certain things in Senegal or in Cote d'Ivoire or in Trinidad, but it's for some reason really hard to hire black African people in DC for some reason, mm. in New York, in London, in Paris. And it's going to, we're unicorns, I know. We're, we're hiding, I think. <laughs> but, so they say. But I think it really is, taking it seriously that if we're going to try to communicate stories that are empowering of our health workers and that you have someone on staff in DC supporting you to do that because I don't think there's any white person who can do that on their own mm. um, especially if you're trying to tell the stories of African people there are African people who would be happy to be paid to support mm -hmm. you and your <laughs> initiative yeah. and yeah um, Read it. Or, or, or lead it. And, and I, I think I, I like to, when, when I say things like that, I think a lot of people go into self-preservation mode mm -hmm. that, oh God, does decolonizing development mean like, let's get rid of the white people right, and let's no, replace no. white people with African people. Um, that's a problematic viewpoint, mm -hmm. I know. Um, but it is about, are you being inspired and are you citing, are you 
elevating African expertise and Af African voices on their own without being their voice for them. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's possible unless you have an African person with you in DC mm -hmm. or on your staff and you can retain them because they're essential to, to that effort. I would probably also add, I tend to work with communications people a lot because they like tell us the data and walk us through it so mm. we can make it a better story. Yeah. Um, I think I've personally changed a lot of how I even view data, right? Mm -hmm. So it is a story. You have to look at it as a story. What is it telling you? Who is the person that's telling you the story? And I think one thing that we, do, we don't do well is waiting until the quarterly report or the semi-annual report, or the annual report, or the end of project report, God forbid, it mm -hmm. waits five years, right, mm -hmm. to get the story. So don't wait until that moment. I think for me as a researcher, you're always listening, right? You have antenna where you are, oh, this person is sharing their experience. That is a case study. Mm. It is the story. Sometimes it's a good story, positive. Sometimes it might be a negative story, but it is a story. Mm -hmm. Right. And so us putting good, bad is like a label. It's valuing that isn't coming from that person per se. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think frequent, regular, whatever you want to call it, uh, listening mm -hmm. and sharing is the way to do it and not just, you know, OK, we need this thing for the donor. Go in country, get the story. Right. And I think that's that's one recommendation that I would have for a communications team mm. from my mm -hmm. perspective. Angela? We're done. Done. We're, we're, we're done. <laughs> oh, we're done. Aaron, wrap up, like, right? I also want to acknowledge the question from the person from Anacostia. Yes. Um, oh, yes. yes. Um, yeah. Could you, would you be able to, because I, I really think that's What's the really goal of it all? Hel yeah, I think it really kind of. We could wrap up, you could use that as a wrap up question. You, yeah, use that okay, as a wrap up fine. question, yeah. um, just because we are here in Washington, D.C., and a lot of us are not from here, right? Um, and just acknowledging where we are and how we fit within t the longer history, like the long standing history of DC and yeah. what it was and what it will be. Um, so, um, could you speak, could, maybe if you can ask the question again um, and, and then folks could answer? Yeah, just in regards to cultural competence and globalization, um, because we are in DC, and thank you for acknowledging not only um, my native ancestors, but also my black ancestors in, in your introduction, um, <clears throat> and what we've walked through to be here in, in 2019, y'all. Mm. <laughs> like yeah. literally, the, what we're witnessing yesterday with Amber um, Geiger's trial, like mm -hmm. the, we have to be mindful of what we're doing with the laws that we put into play and and you know just even the way that our own constitution has been developed um, and amended over time what is our end game like what is our goal what are we doing are we shifting each other's um, idea of what culture is and if we're doing so um, why are we doing that mm -hmm. um, being a native woman, a black native woman, like I'm very, I'm hyper aware of what tribalism means. And in the United States, we've done mm -hmm. a good job of carrying on that tradition. We have 50 states um, in the district. We have no right to vote for Congress mm -hmm. in yeah. the district. So we have a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, again, so once we have this power, once we have this voice, clearly Americans are, are interestingly um, in in the colonization space because we come mm -hmm. from the the European side of us come from the British Crown which has been very good at colonizing um, the entire world um, but we we are our, our white ancestors here were escaping persecution of that colonization mm -hmm. in a way well. right so if we're escaping it but at the same time participating in it like what are we doing mm. I, I don't know how else to ask I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah it's a contradiction right yeah. and we all live in contradiction yes. in that way I, I, I don't know <laughs> <laughs> you know it's a funny thing you know the contradiction and I think we, we started off with a conversation about the contradiction, contradiction. Mm -hmm. because you were saying that you are a disarming black woman mm -hmm. and so you're the disarming black woman in one world and then you get on a plane and when you get to, to back to your home mm -hmm. or countries in Africa, you're another person. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's hard to kind of live with all these various contradictions in ourselves. Mm -hmm. I find myself sometimes, you know, like if I'm in my house, I sound like I'm from Trinidad, right? Mm -hmm. um, my husband's right there. So, um, you know, we talk like Trinidad people talk. Mm -hmm. And then 
and it, and the phone would ring and it could be someone in my office and I would be like a totally different person. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, hello, you know. <laughs> it's so weird. And I think part of it is because I think we struggle because we know what's acceptable. Mm. And we know that to survive, we have to do what's acceptable. Yes. And because all of us have to pay our house note and all of us have to feed our children and all of us have to do things. So I, I think... I, I don't have a great answer, but I, I, I know the contradiction. And I struggle with it all the time. And I feel like as a Caribbean woman with an American passport, I, I navigate in sometimes in various parts of the world where I realize that on one hand, I'm really privileged and on the other hand, but at the same time, I wanna be, I wanna be a part of, 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 the, other, of the other parts mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's how I, I acknowledge it mm. every day that I know that it's a contradiction, but I feel like it's 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 also about survival for some of us. Mm. Right? Yeah. I think that's similarly for me, right? I think I'm a walking contradiction. I think <laughs> just all the time, uh, it's extremely difficult. Exhausting. It's exhausting, and I think you know there have been several meetings that I have sat in and cried mm. because I just not sometimes sad, but sometimes really mad. Mm. and not knowing which direction mm -hmm. to take that anger. Mm -hmm. Because I don't want to be the angry black woman. Right. I don't want to ruffle feathers because I also recognize that my actions can impede work for people mm -hmm. that I'm working to support. Mm -hmm. So it's extremely challenging. I might be able to, and there are moments I have done it, speak up, sometimes walk out mm. of a mm -hmm. room because I just cannot stand anymore saying, we'll get to the participants later, we'll get their input later. I have walked out of a room, but I can walk out of that room mm -hmm. and go to my house in Anacostia where I'm still gentrifying my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. But I mm -hmm. can walk and I have my paycheck. Mm -hmm. Someone else that I'm working for can't walk away and will be harmed because I spoke up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there is a tension with that and it's, it, I'm even like I'm getting emotional right now. It is trying to figure out on a daily basis when to speak, how to speak, if to speak at all. And sometimes I might say, I'm going to let this one go for now, but I'll be back <laughs> on that yeah. conversation. Absolutely. And I started a company in February because I'm tired of seeing evaluators from other countries go to these places, mm -hmm. especially in Africa, and run a study. There are people in continent, in country, who are perfectly capable of doing it with a few tools and with what they know they need. Yeah. How can we, how can I leave a bit of myself with those people? Mm -hmm. And I think that's, for me, it sounds weird, like, but leaving a bit of myself in different places that might be in a room in a meeting at my headquarters office. It might be when I'm in country and I say, I'm Ghanaian. I come to you as a Ghanaian. Mm. But that is yeah. the way that I try to conceptualize that. And can I say just the importance of having communities of black women within international development has been what keeps all of us in international development. Without other black women in this space, we are the, usually the only black person at where we work. We are the only, usually the only black person traveling to Africa on a team. Yep. We are the only black person internalizing the white supremacy and the racism, and it is crippling. It is mm -hmm. debilitating. And so just emphasizing the need for community within this and being unapologetic that I stand in solidarity with black women in international development. That is the sisterhood I align myself with. I'm getting emotional. Oh yeah. my God. It's okay. Um, <laughs> it's, it's an act of activism mm. for us. And it, I think it's a means to an end to stay in this mm -hmm. and to, to work continuously. So, so with that, <laughs> we are going to, oh. We have one more. One more. <laughs> Go, for it. Go for it. Go for it. Ooh, that was good. 
So firstly, thank you um, uh, to everybody on the panel. I think this has been really inspiring and refreshing. I've been in this space for, for 30 years. And um, while I see some change, and I think a lot of it is thanks to activists and voices like you 30 years, years ago at the bank, I never would have spoken up about a panel that didn't have people of color or a project that wasn't uh, consul consulting people on the ground. But I think today, sort of, I'm empowered to do that in my work. Um, the, the, the one question sort of I want to le leave us with is, is whether the, the, the term non-consensual relationships mm -hmm. is the right term, um, like w whether we're dancing around the issue too, too softly or lightly, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Does mm -hmm. that term capture sort of the anger, um, mm -hmm. the fatigue, right? The, fatigue. the colonization, <sighs> um, no. the power imbalances. <laughs> and so I feel like if we're naming um, Th then we have to name, right? Mm. And 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 to me, like because I'm in this room and I understand this conversation, I get what that means. But does everybody else? Mm. And do we need to do this in a different way and call it out a, a little more forcefully in order to see the change that we'd like to see um, okay. happen? Yeah, yes. That's a great question. That's a good question. I think I would like to answer that just because I provided the framework. Okay. Um, I would say yes and right. Um, I think we can understand, I think we can, con I think it's definitely um, useful for us to provide that framework and understanding of consent throughout our lives and always like, and that would mean a lot of work internally. Um, it, and just in thinking about how we are in relationship with each other and how we want to be right in relationship with each other. So that's why I kind of thought about consent and th you know, obviously it comes from like the sexual violence context. Um, but yes, we need to be naming all of those things and we need to be naming, naming them without you know, shame or guilt, um, without apology. Um, so I want to say yes and, both and to that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So, so we are come to the end. In fact, we're a little bit over um, <laughs> our allotted time. And so I want to say, first of all, thank you to Black Women in Development founder. Oh, God. Right here. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> For those of you who don't know about Black Women in Development, it was the brainchild of Stephanie here. Mm. And a year ago, we met for uh, breakfast, mm -hmm. and she told me all about it. And I said, I'm going to join. And since, since last year, we are about how many women? About like 3,300. Yeah. So last year all was over. about 40 women. Yeah. <laughs> and, this, and we are about 3,300 black women around the world mm -hmm. um, who we, we talk. It's an online Facebook group, um, closed. We talk about um, <laughs> we talk about jobs. We talk about opportunities. We share articles. We talk about microaggressions. We talk about sometimes the the playing, wearing all the masks mm -hmm. that we wear at work, taking it off, putting it back on, knowing when it's the right mask. Um, we talk about all that in the group, and the group has really helped me to really b build a community of women like me in DC. And I, you know, that's how I met, Aaron, you know, met Erin and, and many women that are sitting here today. So, Stephanie, you may not have thought about it last year, but you've done, it's been an thank amazing you. opportunity. And lastly, before we close, I'd like to thank, more than anything else, uh, Center for Global Development yeah. uh, for al allowing us this space. Um, a few months back, I contacted um, Amanda Glassman, and I said, hey, Amanda, we'd l we have this group. I'd love you to you know, help us to kind of bring ourselves off of Facebook mm -hmm. into the real world. Mm -hmm. And she said, sure, let me connect you to some people. So Amanda, Leverett, and Megan, and Angela, um, you all have been- Ashley. And, Ash and Ashley, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ashley. Yeah, Ashley, yeah. Ashley <laughs> right. Um, you all have been amazing. Thank you um, for allowing us this opportunity to have this very challenging and difficult conversation in such a public uh, space. We mm -hmm. appreciate it. And we um, have a, recept a little bit of a networking reception. There'll be some more food outside, all courtesy of Center for Global <laughs> Development. <laughs> and thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Good job. <laughs>